Howdy, this is Bill Olson and another episode of Free Speech Zone. Now, two weeks ago, we were giving away that uh, uh, Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth magazine, and uh, one of the fellows that wanted one gave us his address, and we did not uh, manage to get it into the mail before we lost that address, sorry. So if you call us back today, and we'll, I'll make sure you get one. Uh, I, that's a great way to start the show, okay? Well, anyway, we've got a lot of things going on, um, and we'll cover them in this show. One of the things is the uh, Russian passenger jetliner that was flying from Egypt to Russia, and it got, well, shot down or blown up, whatever. And we'll talk a little bit about the way the press is handling that and other aspects of that. And, uh, you know, things are, it's, it's funny, that things are really unraveling for the global elite. They're ha they had to put everything on kind of a fast track because the original plan, they were going to stretch it out a little longer, apparently, and all the publicity that they've been getting, you know, everything that they're planning, they've written down, and they didn't think that anybody would read that, oh, gee, you know. So, you know, these folks aren't exactly the top of their class, uh, and they have this obsession with money to, you know, it doesn't matter what it costs, even their own plan could go down the drain, you know, as long as they keep working towards that money. And, uh, you know, we're, we're revisiting things about 9-11 all the time. And recently, well, we had it on the air before when Cheney put out some of his memoirs and then people started questioning him about torture. And one of the very best examples of, uh, you know, putting Cheney in his place was done by Glenn Greenwald on a uh, recent interview. So let, let's go ahead and run that video and then I'll be back and we'll get into some discussion about other things. All right, ladies and gentlemen, do we have some good equipment here? Yeah, it, it blew up right away. Well, okay, then I'll, I'll go into a little bit of a discussion about something I started last week. And this is, this is what really is kind of funny. Usually it's not very funny. Oh, we got the video going. Okay, well, all right, well, let's play the video and then we'll come back. New York Times got an advanced copy of former Vice President Dick Cheney's memoir, an assignment which I hope included a hardship pay bonus. According to the Times write-up in the book, Cheney gives readers a vision of the world in which he was a lone, courageous visionary surrounded by cowards and imbeciles. He says CIA Director George Tenet's decision to resign when, quote, the going got tough was unfair to the president. He takes credit for helping to push out Secretary of State Colin Powell after the 2004 election, and he throws Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice under the bus for trying to get a nuclear weapons agreement with North Korea. Even throws in a condescending line about how she, quote, came into my office, sat down in the chair next to my desk, and tearfully admitted I had been right. Cheney also defends torture, or what he calls tough interrogations. In your view, we should still be using enhanced interrogation? Yes. No regrets? No regrets. Should we still be waterboarding terror suspects? I would uh, strongly support using it again if circumstances arose where we had a, a high-value detainee and that was the only way we could get him to talk. Even though so many people have condemned it, people call it torture, you think it should still be a tool? Yes. When I saw the article yesterday about Cheney's book, I dashed off an email in a fit of pique to some friends who work in publishing, saying basically, everyone at Simon & Schuster, which is publishing the book, should be ashamed of themselves. Now, upon further consideration, I think that's too harsh. The entire Simon & Schuster company isn't responsible for one division publishing one book. But I think the reason I got so angry, what's so troubling about this Cheney publicity lab, is the fact that he has managed to escape not only legal sanction for advocating and overseeing the implementation of the war crime, that is torture, but that he also has appeared to manage to escape social sanction as well. Everyone is now going to treat him as just another memoirist for the books to sell, and he'll have his book party and give his interviews and cash his checks as if he were Keith Richards. What would someone in power have to do to put themselves outside the bounds of polite society? 
When powerful people are not held to account, when they have no worry about their reputations, it creates a moral hazard, not unlike what's happened with the banks. Anti-social behavior is rewarded, failure is also rewarded, and we're trapped inside a system of perverse incentives. So Dick Cheney can openly defend and advocate torture and profit off of it just in time for the 10th anniversary of September 11th. Joining me now is Glenn Greenwald, columnist for Salon.com. Glenn, thanks so much for coming on. It's good to be here, Chris. Uh, Cheney gave an interview to NBC about the book. I'm going to play you this sound. This book is going to make a lot of people angry. There are going to be heads exploding all over Washington, Jim. <laughs> you know that. Yes. I feel like this sort of notion that the heads are exploding sort of reduces the complaint against Cheney to some sort of standard partisan invective. What do you think? I mean, that's the critical issue, Chris. Let's just be very clear about what it is that Dick Cheney did. He directly participated by his own boastful account in the implementation of a domestic spying program that subjected thousands of Americans on U.S. soil to having their emails read and telephone calls listened to by government agents without the warrants required by the criminal law. The institution of the worldwide torture regime went way beyond waterboarding. It included a whole variety of techniques that the U.S. has constantly prosecuted other people and other nations for using, and according to General Barry McCaffrey, it was one whereby we, quote, murdered dozens of people in our custody, and then he was the driving force behind a war of aggression, an attack on Iraq, that ended the lives of at least 100,000 innocent human beings and and far more. And and what's so troublesome is, is exactly what you just said, which is we've decided now to treat those like simple policy disputes, like mistakes that he made, rather than what they are, which is among the most serious and egregious crimes committed over the last decade, if not in, in this generation. I mean, there's a statute in place that said if you eavesdrop on Americans without warrants, you go to prison for five years for each offense. We have a treaty that requires that we will prosecute all people who order torture. Um, General Taguba, who, who was tasked with investigating this, said that there's no doubt that high Bush officials created war crimes. The only question is whether they'll be held to account. And then in the Nuremberg trials after World War II, the U.S. prosecutor in charge of that tribunal said the worst crime is not genocide or bombing hospitals or anything else. It is uh, a war of aggression. That is the kingpin crime. And yet Dick Cheney is in the middle, by his own proud admission, of all of those crimes. And, and yet we don't treat him like a criminal. We instead immunize him from his crimes and, and treat him like a celebrity and, and reward him for it. How much do you think, and you wrote about this today in Salon.com, where, where your blog is, you, you write about the sort of look forward, not backward mantra, which has generally been the, the posture of the Obama administration, although I think that wasn't necessarily the posture in the beginning and has certainly become the posture. How much do you think that contributes to this sort of, this kind of um, normalizing of, of, of what Cheney ha has done and continues to defend? It's easily the biggest factor. I mean, if you look at theories of criminal law, um, I mean, imagine if, for example, we decided to announce tomorrow that we were no longer going to prosecute murder or rape or child abductions because we didn't want to keep looking backward. We wanted only to look forward. What would you think would happen? Obviously, there'd be a lot more people engaging in murder, rape, and child abduction because the deterrence against doing that has been removed. We've decided we're not going to prosecute that. What we've done in American political culture, ever since Gerald Ford pardoned Richard Nixon to the cheers of most media figures, um, is have decided that our highest political officials are free to break the law without consequences. We saw that with Iran-Contra as well and a whole variety of other instances. And so when Barack Obama got into office and essentially began pressuring the Justice Department through all kinds of means not to prosecute Bush officials for all of the crimes that I began by describing, he has continued this evisceration of the rule of law for political political elites at the same time that ordinary Americans are imprisoned by the same government, the same state, at rates greater than any country in the entire world. And, and so political elites like Dick Cheney know that they will not, they can commit crimes and, and with total impunity and that's why he goes around proudly boasting about the crimes he's committed because President Obama has made clear that neither he nor anyone else in the administration will be prosecuted for those very serious um, breaches of the criminal law. 
I guess my final question is, g given that state of affairs, <laughs> given the sort of um, consensus of normality that has seemed to sort of now settled in over the policy disputes of torture um, and illegal wiretapping, etc., how do you begin to culturally counteract that, if that's, if that's not too broad a question? Because th this, this notion of how you kind of mark off what is over some line in, in polite society is a really tricky one, but I feel like there has to be some sort of concerted effort, at least among critics and intellectuals and other people paying attention, that does that. Well, law is supposed to be, of course, the principal way that yes. we say there are certain lines that you cannot cross, right? I mean, there are certain things that are impolite that might result in social stigma, but there are certain things that you can't do that are far worse than impolite. They're criminal, and you're supposed to go to prison for them. And we've erased those lines. But as you've suggested, we've erased an even more disturbing line, which is even the idea of a social stigma. So, you know, we love in American politics and American political discourse to talk about other countries' leaders and the horrible crimes they've committed and look at what these dictators are doing and these awful people in that other country are doing. And yet we have political leaders, a leader, a class of leaders who have committed what we've always said, what we Americans have always said for decades are among the worst and most egregious crimes. And independent of, of the law, the, the legal immunity, you're absolutely right. You won't see barely any media figures treating Dick Cheney with even the smallest degree of hostility or animosity. He will be treated like any other elder statesman who might have some political controversial positions, but he won't be shunned by anyone. And what that guarantees is that that behavior becomes normalized. Both parties have accepted it by not prosecuting it, um, and, and I think that's a very dangerous thing to do. Glenn Greenwald of Salon has a book coming out very soon, which you are going to want to read. Thanks for joining me tonight. Really appreciate it. Great to be with you. Okay, now, it's, it's more than just the social stigma going away, like Glenn, Green, <laughs> Glenn Greenwald was saying. Uh, it's it's shifted. They're using social stigma against the general citizen right now. I mean, you'll find these groups that are doing what they call uh, internet shaming, you know, for using that type of language. Or do you know that that's a hate word? God, you know, it. So what if it is? It's protected speech anyway. Don't did you forget that? The First Amendment protects hate speech. So the idea of, you know, somebody comes up and he stabs somebody to death. Okay, that's a murder. But if you know that he stabbed him because he hates the guy and the guy was Jewish and he hates him because he was Jewish, now it's a hate crime. So all of a sudden, a constitutionally protected speech becomes a crime that gives you a higher penalty. What? Have we gone crazy? We have perfectly good laws to cover all the crimes and the idea of a hate speech is crazy. Now I heard Lionel Nation giving just about that exact same speech right there and uh, I, I wasn't plagiarizing. We're, we're just kind of co-inventors of the same speech without consulting each other. Um, I felt like that for years and uh, it, it's it's insane. We're we're they're switching it all the way around. Verizon just got the notion that they have the right to censor your emails now. Looking for hate words or terrorist words or some something, you know whatever it is. But they plan to correct it in real time. What does that mean? You won't even be able to send your email. I mean it's crazy, and. Then we get back to this free speech thing. And remember, for years and years, everything Alex Jones said was countered with, you're just a conspiracy nut, a crazy tinfoil hat wearing guy that nobody should listen to. Alex Jones was saying 9-11 was an inside job. And CNN came back saying things like, there's no such thing as a government in spite inside job. You know, you're crazy. That doesn't happen. And now we talk about that same thing Greenwald was mentioning, you know, the, the idea that if it's another country, we can, you know, really come down on them hard. But our own country, we won't. So we didn't have an inside job on 9-11. No, uh-uh-uh. 
But this airplane that just came down flying from Egypt to Russia, oh, that was an inside job. CNN boasts proudly. Sorry, I whacked the microphone. and <laughs> probably blew the ears off the sound guy. Well, anyway, so this airplane definitely got blown up. Alex Jones said that before anybody else. And it's not because he's a conspiracy nut. He can read the tea leaves. I mean, it's, I mean uh, that's a bad example because that's mystic again. But no, it's, it's simple. The information is all around. And certain things, you know, you just can't get away from. Like the science of the, of the thing. You spread debris and bodies for eight miles. It blew up in the air. It's that simple. Like Flight 93. Remember Flight 93? The one that hit Shanksville? And guess what? They said, oh, there was a mine shaft, an old closed mine shaft that went down pretty deep. And the airplane just went, must have, everything went down there. The wings folded back and it went down like a skydiver. Boom, it hit it. And everything got buried so there weren't any bodies or parts of the airplane or anything to be seen at the... And no, take a look at this Russian airplane and see how the plane should look with that debris spread all over the place. So CNN comes out and says, yes, it was definitely an inside job is their headline. Well, okay, so Alex Jones deserves a little bit of, of you know, airtime to, to sit and gloat. And it just so happens that he did, well, not really gloating, but, you know, at least saying things the way they are. And so we're going to play this little video here. It's recorded in Alex Jones's own house. And I was kind of taking a look around what he chose to reveal to the public in his own home. But uh, anyway, he's going to talk about this subject. We're going to kind of cut it off short at the end when he starts, you know, asking for donations and things. Because uh, we can't do that on cable access. So anyway, here's Alex Jones. Alex Jones here with a special report from home. It's Friday night. We can say pretty clearly that the Russian uh, downing of the airliner, the second largest terror attack and loss of life since 9-11, is an inside job any way you slice it. And by the way, folks, that's not Alex Jones saying that. That's the CNN headline. They're saying it's an inside job. But see, they're the bosses. They control language and they decide what words you can and can't use. So when they use inside job or self-inflicted wound, stage terror, false flag, they're allowed to. You see, because they sit back orchestrating like we're fish or birds in a cage or controlled creatures in a Truman show feeding us what they want us to know. They've had several cases the last few years of young women that were grabbed as children and kept as basically sex slaves in walled off trailers and, and, you know, walled off uh, uh, barns behind houses. And when they finally break out, they can't believe there's a whole other world even out there. Some of them are grabbing that were three or four years old. And that's what the general public is like. You can't be too mad at them because they've been in a controlled environment since birth with the advent of the television sitting in front of their TV is just being slowly fed garbage. And at first, TV had a lot of good family messages and things like that in it to bait the earlier generations into fully submitting to it like it's a trusted babysitter. And then when mommy and daddy walked off by the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, the social engineering began. And now we've gotten to the point where they say that your five-year-olds belong to them and they get up there and say that the family's an evil thing. Let's go on over here and show you the CNN report. And we're gonna post this video up on Infowars.com and Facebook and everywhere else. We need to go mega viral because it's important. We said last weekend, a day after this happened, that clearly it was a bomb or a missile. Planes just don't blow up and strewn themselves over miles. Unless it's Flight 93 back in 2001, and all the witnesses of it blowing up in the sky. But still, ignore those conspiracy theorists. We all know about Let's Roll. And about the phone calls made by the Solicitor General's wife from 33,000 feet that the FBI admitted didn't happen. Those calls? didn't happen. Look it up. But here it is. An inside job. It's not just that cell phones didn't work at that height. They admit there's no phone records. An inside job. Data indicates a bomb on board flight 9268. Analysts say inside job from CNN? They say that's sacrilege to talk about self-inflicted wounds or false flags or 
or inside jobs, even though most bank robberies uh, historically that are really large over a bunch of safety deposit boxes and things, usually have somebody working inside the bank that helps the robbers. There's some type of inside job or most arson, it turns out, of businesses or homes, uh, not so much fields or woods, but uh, of property is inside job. But when government's involved, oh, no, 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 they never do anything wrong because they're so accountable and governments are so perfect historically. And questioning the official narrative is conspiracy theory or sacrilege or what they call it when somebody uh, didn't go along with the church or whatever. Heresy. Heresy. Thank you, Buckley. Heresy. Buckley does a great job as the weekend camera guy for these <laughs> with his iPhone. So here you go, uh, CNN right there. Another conspiracy theory that I can even point my finger. Uh, they've had, I've had permission from the media. Can I put my finger? Thank you, CNN. You're the boss. You control reality. Uh, an inside job. Data indicates bomb on board. So it goes on. Of course, you can tune into InfoWars hours after it happened, we tell you that. And that was probably airline workers there inside and probably ISIS retaliating back to Russia for bombing the hell out of them to try to cut off tourism uh, to both Egypt and to Russia and to destabilize things. DHS, more security for U.S. bound flights from some airports and some domestic airports they're reporting on NBC News. Funny, our government runs and funds Al-Qaeda and ISIS. We've been predicting this would happen, this would start. Now they say they have Stinger missiles as we predicted and they're gonna start shooting on planes. And the answer will be to grope your daughter or your son or your wife or you and put you in a naked body scanner where the former head of DHS makes millions of dollars. The company, billions. I mean, even if you think the naked body scanners are good, well, how can Chertoff order the machines, leave a year later, and one, one week before they're about to be delivered, the underwear bombing happens, which we proved was an inside job. We broke that with witnesses on board the plane. Later came out in Congress that the CIA got him on the plane drugged with a firecracker in his pants. And because of that, Land of the Free Home of the Brave crapped its collective drawers and begged for proctology exams by the TSA. But see, when they start shooting down airliners with Stinger missiles, they'll have to have checkpoints miles away from the airports. You see how that works? Real terrorists would blow up the security line, folks. They wouldn't actually even try to get a bomb through. And the real threat isn't terrorists getting bombs through security. It's the food delivery. It's the people with baggage. It's it's the inside job again. That whoa, I just said it. CNN, is it okay if I say inside job? Again, I'm trying to figure this out. All right, that's it. Uh, Infowars.com has been redesigned. I'd give it a A plus. It's got a good clean look. Most people, I'd say about 75 to 80% love it. Maybe another 10% think it's okay. Another 10% or so do not like it. All right. Yeah, we tried to cut it short before they started saying how cool they were, why they need money. We all need money, and we know that. So don't just, you know, don't worry about us asking for it. Now, uh, they've, they've gone kind of crazy. Uh, we got a real problem now. See, what their own propaganda is backfiring on them. If they're going to play us like there's a terrorist threat, and where are the terrorists? Why, somewhere out there. And we've got to monitor everything you do in case you get the idea to be a terrorist someday or maybe you are a terrorist, it doesn't really matter because we're beginning to believe our own lies that you're the threat. And now we're getting to be really afraid of the threat that we've already created that doesn't really exist. You, we're afraid of you, deathly afraid of you. And the other day you really, really scared us. You know how you did it? There were two or three or four people wearing those V for Vendetta masks in a march. My God, we didn't know who they were! Oh, what if they were terrorists? Oh! So we're going to make a law against marching anywhere with a mask. All right, well, guess what? They announced the Million, Man, Million Mask March. I love it. We'll see what happens with that pretty quick. But I would be out there wearing a stack of masks. Oh, you want to take off my mask? There's another one underneath. And another one. And another. Okay, well, anyway. It's just the idea that it's time for that type of passive rebellion. The idea that they have a right to tell you, you know, 
what sort of Halloween costume you should wear? Get out of my face. You know, that's another First Amendment protected right. You don't get to say what type of Halloween costume I want to wear if I want to wear one. And so, okay, put on your mask and join the Million Mask March. Wear a mask wherever you go. Put it on in your car. Whatever you have to do. Just, you know, in your face, law enforcement, you stupid idiots. You're afraid of your own shadow. And guess what? You invented your own shadow, the one you're afraid of. And guess what you did? The law enforcement wants to spread this fear so much, but they're only spreading, spreading it amongst themselves. So these heavily armed cops, completely covered with armor. Now, we're wearing armor. It must be because we're facing a real threat out there. We have to wear this armor all the time. My God, this is how the policeman is. They're, they're out there to get me. And then you get the government you know, the, the secret government playing the race card, trying to get a, a race war going between blacks and cops. And so now the cops almost have something real to worry about. But guess what they've done anyway? And this they kind of brought it on themselves. Anything that moves is a threat. So they've elevated removing your wallet or talking on a cell phone. What type of response do they have? He's got a gun! Bam, 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 empty out three clips on your Glock, 42 rounds. Okay. Real good idea. Killing, cops kill 450 civilians every year. You know, now the problem, you know, in a battle or something like that, that happens, I suppose. But unarmed civilians, like the one running from the cops, shot in the back, and then the jury finds him acquittable what kind of world do we live in when you're shot in the back running away and there's a video of it you cannot say that was accidental you can't say anything that in his defense about that it's right there so the only thing you can conclude is that the justice system was corrupt Well, part of this thing about the culture of lying, you know, made famous by the Bush administration and, and the neocons, I mean, not that it is something new. They've been lying to us for as long as I've been alive that I know of personally, and the history books show that they've been lying to us for much longer than that. But it's this thing about ISIS and Al-Qaeda. Okay, well, you keep hearing us say, and you heard Alex Jones say a minute ago that, yes, those are creations of the CIA, Western intelligence. And so, you know, you can understand kind of from the point of view, well, you, you need to have the bad guy so that the good guy has a reason to exist. So, you know, what, we ought to be justifying bombing everybody. The goal is bombing. The goal is actually spending the money on munitions which are so very expensive and then you have to blow them up so you have reason to buy more so it's an ideal business to be in but you got to sell it to the public and so you have to have the boogeyman and al-qaeda and it took them 11 years to get bin laden you know why do you think it took that long do you think that it's just sheer incompetence <laughs> i got news for you the military really is good at what it does if you keep the civilian pol politics BS out of it. But uh, the boogeyman's gone now. So they have to come up with something. Al-Qaeda, everybody's kind of either poo-pooing it, you know, or, or maybe they were kind of halfway believe. Maybe it was a creation of, of U.S. intelligence. But now ISIS, no, no, that's another group completely. They're savage. They're a lot worse than Al-Qaeda ever was. Well, they just changed the nameplate on their headquarters, basically. And they unleashed the crazies, kind of like we do over here. The people that are just love to go hurt other people. That's, that's to our advantage, because that really is the bad boogeyman. We got to, as if, what, what is business is it of ours? You know, the, 
that we have to go all the way to the other side of the world to blow everything up. And does blowing everything up help? No, of course not. And so why do we just let them keep doing it? Well, that's okay because I, as I started to say last week, I kind of got off track a little bit. Putin is a very, very smart man. He's a chess player, you can see. And, okay, he's looking at just what I just described, how, you know, Western intelligence, the pol politicians here in the West should really be in a very embarrassing position, but they're not because the media lets them go along with it. I mean, the media covers it up, the media whitewashes it, the media doesn't investigate anything. They write down what they say and just repeat it, kind of like Colbert said in that national uh, press club luncheon that he spoke to in 2006, I think it was. But so here's what Putin decides. You know, it's great because the problem from his point of view, obviously, is and, and most of the people in the Middle East and elsewhere in the world, the big number one problem is that America is going over there and bombing everything illegally. I mean, there, nothing America is doing has any legal basis to it whatsoever. In fact, under almost every type of law you can think of, international laws, humanity uh, has suffered from the United States and is still suffering. And Putin can see that. Well, how do you stop the United States without just declaring war on our ass and causing something really big? Well, it was, it was a stroke of genius. Okay, America's fighting ISIS, but we just don't seem to be making much progress no matter how many bombs we drop and how many countries we bring down trying to do it. And uh, Putin says, ah, I can help you. I can get them very easily. Watch this. Boom, bam. And he starts blowing them up and blow wiping them out. But we can't have that. Those are our guys. No, don't do that. Oh, you can't. Because ISIS is the bad guy that justifies our military industrial complex's existence. And if they get wiped out by Russia, we're going to have to find another bad guy. Oh, no. What are we going to do? We gotta, you know, we gotta make a deal with Putin to cut that shit out, or at least send his bombers to blow up hospitals like we do, so that we can blame terrorists. You know, come on. Oh, so Putin put us in the place where, oh man, we can't let him keep doing it because they're they're wiping out our guys that we promised we wouldn't hurt. You know, and but on the same time we got to keep convincing the american public you know come here meh, meh, come here american public we're fighting a war to save you we're protecting you be very very afraid and just to protect you we're going to make sure that we're going to censor your mail and we're going to make sure that you don't say any bad words we're going to make sure that we teach your children how to be very sensitive no brown bags at school because poor people are offended by that. Horse pucky! My God! If somebody starts doing that to me, I'm going to look at them and laugh and say, You fell for that nonsense? <laughs> Someone with no intellect at all. You let them maneuver you into a position where you think those words are bad. Where you think that people saying them is a horrible thing. And you forgot all about the First Amendment. You forgot that it protects that type of speech, specifically built to protect that type of speech. Because the tendency is for the group of people to get together and burn the witches. But we're protecting the witches because it turns out that burning witches was just a figment of some misguided religious viewpoint and not a fact. There are no such things as evil witches or evil beings like that. They are really mean and evil people. But they're not caused by demons. They have to take all that credit themselves. You don't get to say the devil made me do it. You understand? Those people are evil. Take responsibility for yourself. Don't keep telling that me that there's some magical power making you do things or there's some magical power that's going to save you because a magical power won't save you either. Okay, well, now we're going to play a cut from the Corbett Report with James Corbett from Japan. And 
if, if you aren't watching him on a regular basis, you're really missing out because this guy is a super journalist who does his homework and you can bet that what he says can be backed up. And guess what? If you go to his website, everything he talks about, unlike myself, everything he talks about, he gives you the notes that you can go look it up yourself and see what the source was. And I even did that for a while. It, it kind of got, you know, I got lulled into a, a false sense of security because after checking, you know, dozens of those references, it turns out he never faked anything. He never misinterpreted anything. He didn't misrepresent anything. And this report is just like all the rest is in that type of vein. So let's, let's watch. He's going to talk about the U.S. and China con job. Let's check this out. You're listening to The Corbett Report. Even the most casual observers of the news will have noticed the increasingly bellicose military rhetoric and provocations emerging from both China and the U.S. over control of the Asia-Pacific. China's defense ministry spokesman, Yang Yujun, said today that some countries, quote-unquote, were making tensions in the Asia-Pacific worse. The United States confirmed that it flew two B-52 bombers over China's newly established air defense zone, as well as the disputed Diaoyu Islands. China has sent fighter jets to its newly declared air zone in the East China Sea. Beijing says the jets flew into the air defense identification zone to strengthen monitoring on targets in the area. But behind this conflict is another narrative, one of cooperation, agreements, political coordination, and business arrangements that have created a close tie between China and the U.S. A commitment to cooperation. General Fan Changlong, the vice chairman of China's Central Military Commission, and American General Raymond Odierno oversee the signing of an army-to-army -army agreement on Friday. The deal, they say, will help improve coordination on a number of issues, like humanitarian relief, disaster response, and the fight against terrorism. Military-to-military -military exchanges between the two sides have seen some progress in the past year as the two sides committed to a new model of military relations. This is the second time the trilateral exercise has taken place. This year, involving 30 soldiers and Marines working closely together in the hot and dry Northern Territory wild. The 30 military personnel include 10 from the Australian Army, 10 from the Chinese People's Liberation Army, 5 from the U.S. Army, and 5 from the U.S. Marine Corps. What is the truth behind this story of conflict and cooperation? Is this a genuine rivalry? A smokescreen being used to distract the public? Or a little bit of both? Michelle Chosodovsky of the Center for Research on Globalization explains. China has, China is, in some regards... Uh, an industrial colony. I use that quote-unquote, uh, but at the same time, it is an upcoming um, power uh, on, the, on the global stage. And I should mention that that uh, emerged also um, in the wake of the post-Cold, in the wake of the Cold War, um, where China's alignments vis-a-vis, uh, -vis, particularly vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the Russian Federation, had changed dramatically to what they were in, in the, you know, during the Cold War era. Uh, and in, in the late 90s, particularly in the wake of, of the death of, of uh, Deng Xiaoping and the demise of, of, um, of, uh, and the change of, the change of government in, 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 in the Russian Federation, uh, in other words, uh, when when uh, Vladimir Putin became uh, president, uh, there we have uh, a, a consolidation of of of, uh, of an alliance between the Russian Federation and the People's Republic of China, the development of the Shanghai Cooperation Agreement, and so on and so forth. And another very important dimension in in the in the late nineties. Ironically, just after Deng Xiaoping uh, passed, uh, there is um, 
There's an increased confrontation in the Taiwan Straits. Of course, there was always confrontation in the Taiwan Straits. But then it was at that point that China uh, um, developed its military cooperation agreements with Russia um, and uh, started to build up a naval naval facilities in the South China Sea to counteract U.S. threats. Uh, and, uh, and then, of course, we had a very major shift in geopolitical relations, I would say, as of the late 90s, early uh, 2000, early 21st century, um, which is increasingly towards confrontation between China and the United States. But I, I, sh I should uh, qualify that because when you go to China, you have a very pro-American uh, um, intelligentsia, the people uh, peoples in, in the universities and so on. Um, the, the School of Journalism uh, of Tsinghua University uh, is uh, supported by Bloomberg. Uh, people at the Academy of Social Sciences uh, uh, are very much tied into to Western values and so on and so forth. Uh, so that, in fact, I would say the leadership is profoundly, is very much divided. Um, America is very much, is very visible. Western capital is very visible throughout China. But at the same time, um, it, uh, it, it's more at the political, geopolitical level that there's confrontation. And I think that the Chinese say, well, we're a capitalist economy in our own right. We're not going to be a subordinate colony of the West. Uh, but, but if you look at the actual mechanics of, of foreign trade, they still are because they're producing commodities um, for the world market and they are sort of feeding the non-productive structures of Western capitalism. If we go back in history, I, I would say that the West, in a sense, facilitated regime change in, in China. There's no question about it. It's, it's difficult to research, but Henry Kissinger in 1972, then the Gang of Four and so on, uh, there was a transition towards a reintegration into, into Western capitalism. Okay? And that transition was, was implemented by a dominant clique within, within the Communist Party. Now, that clique is still there. There's, there's no question about it. But there are other areas um, of Chinese society which are firmly anti-American, and, and certainly within the military, uh, the the red, uh, you know, the the People's Army, uh, the, the the situation is, is dramatically different, and uh, uh, and uh, at the same time, there's a, a rather uh, destructive shift in in uh, in U.S. foreign policy which is, I think, really motivated by the realignment of China with Russia under the Shanghai Cooperation Agreement, okay? Um, and uh, it, it's, it's, it, what they want to do is essentially to break that alliance. And, and that alliance is, in a sense, is quite fragile because the, the United States um, and Western countries, uh, let's say Western capitalism, but also Japanese capitalism, have, have, are fairly well entrenched into the fabric of the banking system in China and so on. That the United States is uniquely positioned to play a leading role in the Asia Pacific because of our history, our capabilities, and our credibility. People look to us as they have for decades. The most common thing that Asian leaders have said to me in my travels over this last uh, 20 months is, Thank you. We're so glad that you're playing an active role in Asia again. Because they look to us to help create the conditions for broad, sustained economic growth and to ensure security by effectively deploying our own military. The move to create a permanent U.S. military presence in Australia is a show of solidarity and force. When the president said America now has the presence that's necessary to maintain uh, the security architecture in the region. What he means is an American troop presence in Japan, South Korea, the Philippines, and soon 2,500 Marines and potentially dozens of U.S. Air Force aircraft in Australia to serve as a counterweight to China. We are here to stay. This is a region of huge strategic importance to us. Well, I, I think that really, on, uh, if you look at the U.S. standpoint, 
which is one of world domination. There's a military agenda, there's an economic agenda of dominating the world. And uh, they've succeeded in dominating a large part of the world where they have uh, their own uh, puppet regimes, their proxy regimes all over, who, uh, who, who, which uh, essentially obey orders and, and, uh, and accept the consensus that, that, uh, that the United States and its allies are the dominant powers in the world. Now, uh, the, chi the Chinese will not do that. Uh, that that's very very clear. They they're not they won't do that. Uh, they're doing it in the way I've described through through uh, joint ventures and this that and other. But they're not going to accept a U.S. hegemonic project in in Asia and the Far East. Um, and people who know Chinese history will realize it's called the Middle King Kingdom. It's it's. Uh, it, it establishes its boundaries within uh, within certain realm, and and uh, uh, it is uh, it, they will they will not accept any kind of territorial encroachment. Now you're you're not going to conquer this country in any way, and and uh, uh, and the question I think U.S. policymakers want to subdue China. Um, perhaps they're going. They're not going. Uh, doing it the right way, uh, they'll never be able to encroach on on their territory in the same way as they encroach on the territory of of um, you know of Iraq or Syria. But having said that, uh, let's bear in mind that there is um, there are dirty tricks on the part of the U.S. in supporting insurgencies. Of course, in Tibet, it's well understood. They're, they're supporting a, a, a separatist insurgency, but they're also supporting um, insurgencies in the western provinces, the, the uh, Xinjiang province and the Yuga Autonomous Region, uh, where you have a large Muslim population. And, and there, what are they doing? They're supporting Al-Qaeda-affiliated uh, organizations, which are um, essentially, um, you know, uh, under the... The, the helm of the, of the CIA, uh, creating uh, terrorist events and so on and so forth. So there, there is that kind of inroad. And there's also, and, and there has been for a very long time, I can say for a very long time, there has been a plan on the drawing board to uh, fragment China, to cut China into different, to different republics, so to speak, particularly South China, North China, uh, Tibet, the Western provinces, and so on. So that 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 option has been there, um, and um, uh, and that option is very similar to what they've try, been trying to do in the Middle East. But they're dealing with a very different polity and social reality, and um, and also the the his and a misunderstanding of Chinese history, uh, going back to the Ming Dynasty. So there we are. That that is the groundwork. Is that that now what is at stake is essentially to curb the Chinese tiger, so to speak. Is that we, you know, the 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 Chinese economy has served the Western um, market economy for the last thirty or thirty or more years since the early eighties, and now what Western leaders want to do is to ensure that that's Tiger does not uh, become, does not accede to the status of a global capitalist entity, which would challenge the hegemony of of the United States, uh, uh, United States and and Western Europe, and so on. And the thing is, of course, from a military standpoint, China is a nuclear power. It has a very advanced uh, weapon system, uh, and it has been. Uh, it has been developing that weapon system uh, very carefully together with, you know, with its uh, with its Russian uh, ally, um, uh, and that I think is is another dimension of this uh, of of this um, uh, discussion and debate is that uh, if there is a confrontation with either Russia or China, we're in a very dangerous situation. Um, uh, we we could this could lead to a world war, uh, but uh, um, 
at this stage with regard to China, I don't think that this is likely to happen. It could, it's much more um, focused on Russia at this particular point. Uh, but the, the threats directed against China uh, in the South China Sea, I think are intended uh, to, to weaken uh, China's relationship to Russia. But in fact, as you pointed out, that may, uh, that may in fact do exactly the opposite. It will reinforce the, the military alliance between Russia and China. Okay, now, it's more and more like a chessboard every single day. It's amazing. And our, our policy is driven by insane people who think they can do anything and wield their power any way they want. Now, unfortunately, up till now, they've been right. I mean, remember when they were talking about, you know, cutting Iraq into three different zones? Guess what? That happened. Goal accomplished. I mean, it's more or less about to happen officially. I mean, you don't go to the map and see Kurdistan up above or, you know, the Kurd section. They didn't unify the Kurds like they promised. That's how they got them to help. It's just amazing lie after lie you know deal after deal that we betray and then we actually start getting some blowback like uh i'm trying to think of the the, the author of that blowback trilogy but anyway now they're talking about fragmenting china dividing up china so that's that's step by step we're going to bring down all these governments remember the uh what is it, Gen General uh, Wesley Clark? Didn't he come out right after 9-11 and give us a list of seven countries that we were going to invade and topple and that was supposed to be done within the first five years? Well, it took us 15 years. We're not quite done with the list. That's another example of how bad their planning is. They underestimate the enemy and they overestimate themselves over and over and over again. And we keep going into these deals that on the surface look like we're, you know, making a partnership. But what it really means is we're taking over, baby. And after, you know, we get the leverage, you're out on your ear and you're a third world country. So we're going to turn China into three third world countries. It's just, ah, I can't believe it. And they finally, you know, we're talking about international agreements and so that brings us back into the category of the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Anytime you hear words like that in an agreement, you, you better watch out. Be very skeptical. Let that raise an eyebrow. Partnership. What does it mean? Well, I downloaded everything that was available. It's like 60 different zip files, not zip files, but 60 different PDFs that are pretty long comes in a big zip file, and that's not all of it. It turns out that in order to really understand any of it, there are, you know, each country's agreement carries a whole list of descriptions on how they're going to work the trade with everything, and they list it by item, you know, down to paper clips, or, you know, not quite like that, but just about. And what it's boiling down to is it's going to make an agreement that all of a sudden just shifts power to these corporations that have already usurped power here in our country by <laughs> winning over that uh, idea that their their corporate money is free speech under the Constitution. Remember the First Amendment that we are talking about should be covering hate speech? Well, it turns out that what that First Amendment really was for, and, and we should have known it because, I mean, our forefathers were so smart. They realized that years in the future, the corrupt sociopathic rich were going to need a way to guarantee immunity from any sort of responsibility and a way that these corporations would be able to fight against common sense things like environmental laws, laws to protect people's health, 
laws to protect workers, those are all things designed specifically to attack the poor sociopathic corporate owner. The poor guy needs help, needs our protection. We needed an international agreement that would give the corporation power to sue our government. Not just the government, but, I mean, not just over any government things, but if the government does something that limits their profits, not just limits their profits, but limits their what they expected to profit, why they can win a court case where we have to pay their profit, what they would have made. And there's a good example of that. And I've talked about this on a show before. There is a company, and I don't remember the names of the company, but you can Google the situation and you'll find it. And what I'm talking about is a, a, a Canadian company made an additive that had for years and years been put into Californian gasoline. They had the strictest environmental uh, <coughs> requirements and restrictions in the country, perhaps in the world. And obviously that was one of the biggest problems that the fuel industry had because they couldn't just burn it. They had to fix it up so it would meet some sort of laws. Well, it'd be real nice if you could get around those laws. And along comes, I think that was under NAFTA that they sued, the same sort of agreement. Uh, evidently, cars technology got so good that the, they became much more efficient and clean burning that they no longer needed that additive in California. And so the poor company up in Canada only had one customer, and that was California. It virtually, I mean, it put them out of business. And so under NAFTA, they said, well, we expected to make $4 billion in profit, and we hereby sue the the state of California for that money and the courts awarded them exactly that now it should have been the foreboding message of what this TPP is all about I urge you folks out there to take a look at this TPP thing We're, we haven't put it into law yet it's an agreement that still has to be ratified or whatever by all these different countries including us still We've got to stop it from happening. You know, that's the main thing right now. Okay, well, we're going to see you again next week now. Ron, thanks for calling. I'm going to bring that over to you. I'll be leaving here just after 7, and I'll see you guaranteed before 8. All right, everybody have a good week.